Hello and welcome. So excited to have everyone here. We're going to give it just a moment so everyone can join into the uh, participant room and get everyone in there. And then we will, uh, we will get started. So thrilled that we had such an amazing response and, uh, and turnout today. So I'm really, uh, really excited to have everyone, everyone here. All right, it's 12 o'clock, so we'll get started. So first of all, welcome. I am so excited to be with so many uh, fellow Penn State parents. I think the last time I had the opportunity to be with so many parents was at a football game about a year and a half ago. So I'm really excited that we're all here together uh, as a community. And uh, I can't tell you how much it's meant to me over the last four years to have the resources of other parents to support us. So I'm excited to be able to give back and, and support the community. So while people are filling in, I'm just gonna launch a quick poll. I just wanna get a sense of what is um, on your mind in terms of the biggest challenge for your grad finding a job and just want to confirm you know parents versus students if you could uh, let me know that that would be great uh, just to help me understand you know where what people are thinking about and and what's on their mind <clears throat> so you could take a moment to to uh, to fill that out um, while we're while we're starting um, I just want to make clear there was a lot of questions. This is being recorded. So if for any reason you need to jump off or you're coming in a little bit late, whatever it is, this will be recorded. I will send out the link to re the recording, if not this afternoon or by tomorrow. So everyone will have access to it, everyone that registered. So uh, so no worries. <clears throat> no worries about that. So what a year it's been, right, for, for our kids, for everyone. First of all, I hope everyone is safe. Uh, at this moment, but it's been challenging between, uh, you know, their junior year, year, uh, whatever it was, if they were abroad was canceled, many internships canceled, uh, this whole virtual world, it's been tough. And now coming into this job market and the search of really understanding, um, you know, they're overwhelmed, they're intimidated, they're not sure how to move forward. And I think we as parents are always trying to find the way to do that. And my main goal for our time together here today is to really help them with some practical tips, help you with practical tips and guidance on how to help your student and your grad be successful. And we're gonna cover a few things and then I'm gonna leave it open to Q&A. So first I wanna talk about hiring trends, the trends that are on our mind in terms of the companies and industries that are hiring. I also wanna talk about the market, what, what the predictions are for the class of 2021 as well. And then I want to get into how can you actually help them with the process of looking for a job to get hired? What does that look like? And especially when it comes to networking, to leveraging the phenomenal Penn State network and how the best way to do that is, because I think, uh, I think you know, we as Penn State families have a real advantage by leveraging this network of each other and alumni, and I will, I will talk about that. And then I'm going to answer your questions. So while I'm doing some talking in the beginning, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A um, little box. So if you would be so kind to put your questions into the Q&A box, then I know what's on your mind. I will do my very best to get to all of your questions. Uh, I have a couple of colleagues on as well, and they might link some materials. I have some free resources that I'm happy to share share with you that might also help lend um, some information and, and answer the questions. All right, so let me just introduce myself for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. My name is Beth Hendler Grunt and I am the president and founder of Next Great Step. And our sole focus is to work with college students and recent grads to help them be successful in landing the job that they deserve. And we do that two ways. One, we help them to narrow in and get focused on what is it that I want to do. Even if they had a certain major, sometimes that doesn't always translate to the type of career they want, or sometimes they don't know what they want. We help them figure that out. And then once they've narrowed that down, we help them to be really successful in getting that job with a really simple, structured, step-by-step -step approach. So that's a little bit about Next Great Step. Um, and on a personal note, my son, Brandon, is a senior, like many of your children. He is a psychology major, 
and his internship got canceled last summer. Um, he had to come home from abroad. So as a mom, I am going through the same thing. And just because when mom is the expert doesn't always mean your kids want to listen to you. So I also understand that challenge as well of trying to help them and, and give guidance um, in this during during this time. Um, I wanted to share what some of you said with me before we got on. I had asked everyone in the registration just to share, you know, what's on your mind in terms of what's the biggest concern that you see. And about 40% of you said, you know, the, the term of just find a job. I just need my kid to find a job. It could be in the right field or with a good company or with good pay or that it's challenging. So I think, you know, a lot of you have that on, on your mind of just, I just need them to get something in, in one, one of those aspects. Um, and then about 25% that said that you're really concerned about the market, especially due to COVID, which is absolutely legitimate. Um, the market has changed dramatically and it keeps changing and I will address that a little bit. And then um, the concern about the lack of internship, you know, lack of chances for an experience for our kids to leverage that into a, into a role and, and how does that affect their affect their search and then other people said, you know, worried about competition, worried about career fair. I saw on the parent page the other day the comments about the engineering uh, virtual career fair. We can we can talk about that. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely been been challenging. And I agree with you know your overall feeling about these concerns. But I actually think that before we find the job, that there's ways to help our kids be better prepared whether it's with understanding their skills or how they target certain employers or how they build their network. And that's what I want to, you know, share a little bit about today. So here's the trends that we're seeing specifically in terms of industries and the types of companies that are hiring, because that's what we want to focus them on. We want them to be focused on where the jobs are and, and how to, you know, we'll talk about how you have to transition from what you thought you wanted to where you need to be, but the types of jobs that really are hiring more growing um, sales, business development in a lot of different sectors. So in manufacturing, um, also technology roles, whether it's sales or coding, um, the need for data analytics, uh, software, that is a really continued growing. It's think about how we consume information and how we are buying or purchasing and going about our day. There's a huge need in those businesses, whether it's, you know, the names you think of, Amazon, Oracle, Cisco, IBM, Netflix. Those are the types of organizations that are continuing to grow and need that technical type of role. Um, the other thing we see is, in, which is great for Penn Staters, especially if you have a a son or daughter in the business school is there's a huge demand for help in su supply chain and logistics and how we manage our supply. It's been um, a really fascinating change of how we, you know, the demand for things and what people need, but that is an area that is seeing growth and I think is going to continue to grow as well. I think we're also seeing around us the construction market, real estate, uh, the amount of people that are moving or buying different homes as well. And, and complement to that is the loan and mortgage market. They also have a huge need and demand to support all of that with, with the housing and construction changes. Uh, we also see growth in professional services. And then the other area for growth, because a, a lot of states have made it legal is the cannabis sector. It's actually grown 40% and all kinds of jobs in that area. So I think just being really aware of where the growth is, where the trends are, and understanding to, you know, to look in that direction. Um, a, a word about finance, a lot of last year finance was uh, hiring, doing well. Into the December timeframe, companies like Wells Fargo and JP Morgan pulled back and said they were gonna slow down based on what they saw some of the results. And then I just saw something yesterday that Fidelity is growing and hiring. So I think it's just being really specific whether your kids are looking for analyst roles or whether it's in private equity, mergers, really just to be honed into the companies and the specific um, function that they're looking for you know, in, in that industry. And the additional companies, the same way as before to some other companies that are the top companies that are hiring, um, you know, the obvious ones, Amazon, UPS, Target, as I said before, General Motors. So I think looking at where the jobs are is going to be such an important piece. So maybe your child didn't 
uh, have the exact major. You know, these companies are hiring across all job functions. So even though, let's say Instacart, maybe it's not just, you know, you're not looking to be a frontline shopper, but they need people in HR and infrastructure and finance inside those organizations. And I think to really look towards those companies that have the, the greatest need um, for growth right, right now. The other hiring trends we're seeing in terms of what's happening for our kids. So what's going to happen for the class of 2021? So according to NACE, which is the National Association of Colleges and Employers, right now they see the hiring levels for 2021 to be the same as 2020. I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, things were changing already by the time kids were graduating last year, but they're not seeing a decrease. They're seeing things kind of be steady. Um, and the other thing that is pretty confident is going to be an ongoing trend is this virtual and remote interview. I think the days of in-person uh, interviews is not going to come back for some time. And the more that you can make your you know, son or daughter aware of that and they can get practice and exposure to doing that type of interview, that's going to really help them in the search process because that's how people are assessing it. Even this one-way interview, when there's no one on the other side and they have to be able to read a question in 30 seconds and then have three minutes to answer it. And that creates, I know, a lot of stress for a lot of people. Um, that's a really important piece in terms of understanding how to be ready, ready for that. Uh, and according to a LinkedIn article and poll that was done, but 63% of recruiters expect that hiring will improve in 2021. And I actually have been seeing that so far that I have a lot, we have a lot of clients who are getting hired, uh, that I think people have new budgets. I think they're looking to make changes or they're looking to live in the new normal and they still need to grow and manage. And I, and I do, I really do see optimistic opportunities. And I think the net message that I want to share is that grads are getting hired the 2020 grads, the December 20 grads, uh, and even for, they are getting, there are opportunities. However, the, the rules are a little different. You know, just the blind applying online is going to be very difficult to get a job. It doesn't matter how great your GPA was or how beautiful your resume is. Ultimately, you have to be able to target and really connect with people through your network. And that's my other point that I want to emphasize and talk about with this community is our kids not only need to network, they need to build their network. And one of the best ways is to do that is with the Penn State alumni. Now, a lot of people, will, kids will say, well, I don't know who I'm going to call or I don't know who to reach out to or um, it's really the reality is 80 percent of jobs are found by referral. 80%. And in the end, people hire people, not a tracking system, not a computer system. So being able to make those connections, even if they see a job online, that they still have to connect to someone in the organization to grab their resume or to get them to the next step. That's what needs to happen. And I want to just take a moment to show you in the LinkedIn alumni tool, of what that looks like and how it works. And I'm just gonna share my screen. Let's go refresh it real quick. But my point is what I wanna show you is that inside of LinkedIn, there is on every, every university, but Penn State in particular has their own page called the, it's the Penn State LinkedIn page. And on that page, there are these tabs where you can look up people or jobs, but there is a tab that says alumni. And on the alumni tab is where you're going to see all of these choices to filter, where you will be able to filter in and see, here we go. All right, so here's my son's page. I'm just gonna scroll down. Everybody has this icon of the Nittany Lion on their own page. And when you click it, it brings you to the LinkedIn page. Hopefully everyone is seeing that right now. Um, and I'm just gonna, make sure that everyone can see it. Okay. Um, and you're going to click on this tab here that says alumni. 
And by doing that, you now can access that the 428,000 people that are on the site. And what I tell young people is it can be overwhelming, of course, that's a lot of people. Let's just try to find people who are recent grads who graduated in the last five to seven years. So I'm going to filter that. I can filter on top here. I could say, just show me anybody who started in 2013 and ended in 2020. So it kind of narrows it down and it brings me to those who are a little bit younger. Maybe they're in junior roles, entry level roles, and that starts to narrow that down. And then I think about, well, where do I potentially want to work? Where would I want to talk to people? Maybe I want to work in Philadelphia. So it'll then narrow it down even further. And then I can see, well, show me the companies of where these people are in the Philly area that they're working. Maybe I'm not sure yet. If I go to the next page, it will show me a list of what do they do, whether it's operations, engineering, education, and it also shows me what they studied. So maybe I want to get into information technology. So it'll show me people who are working in the Philadelphia area who, who um, are doing information technology. I can go back again to see, and maybe I also want to see, well, show me the information science majors. So now it's showing me, now there's 291 people that fit my criteria. And if I scroll to the bottom of the page, it shows me who they are. And now you can see, well, maybe here's somebody that, like you, I'm a Penn State alum or soon to be alum, and I'd love to learn more about your role. And that has been a phenomenal way for young people to make connections. So if you go to their page, you can hit the connect button, but you can also write a note saying who you are and why you want to meet. And then once you connect to someone, you have access to their email, their entire profile, and then you can email them a follow-up note. So just by using that type of uh, resource inside of LinkedIn, and I'll just show you, you can also check um, you know, what they're skilled at, how you're connected, but I'll just, you know, and I have a tip sheet. So we're gonna link it in the chat on, uh, there's a link on how kids can use LinkedIn, as well as a tip sheet on how to have a great profile, but just being able to access those people, whether it's, and this is, by the way, this is great for adults. If we're looking for jobs too, you can always go back to your, your alumni um, tool. But if you go to open your, uh, oh, so yeah, Lauren just posted in the chat some resources about how to use LinkedIn. So I'm going to pause and take a look at the questions and see what I can answer for you. Okay, so uh, Kelly, thanks for asking a question. So how do we get past the HR front door considering the flood of resumes each HR department gets? So I'm going to restate what I just talked about. Of course, that's the problem. There's hundreds of applications. So when you apply online, hundreds of applications are being sent to um, a company. I just, we were talking to uh, someone yesterday that uh, Delta Airlines are, were hiring thousands of people at, at once. So the way you get past that is that you have to connect with someone who's there. It could be, it doesn't have to be an HR person. It's someone who's in the job that they want. So if your son or daughter really wants to get into data analytics, the best thing would be to go to the Penn State page, see if there's anyone from Penn State, first of all, who works at that company. And doesn't matter what year they graduated, you can leave all the years open, but if there's someone younger and reach out saying, I'm, I see that you're in this role, I'm really interested in it. I, I wouldn't initially say, hey, I really want this job, can you help me? They don't know you yet. And I think that's sometimes a problem too, that young kids, <laughs> kids will say, you know, I really need an internship or I really need this. No, when someone doesn't know you, you can't ask for too much. You have to build that relationship. You have to first show interest in them or why you want to talk to them, or why their role is interesting to you, and then get into a conversation about why you're interested, the skill set that, that, you know, that you have, and then, hey, you know, based on my skills, do you, is there any opportunities or anyone that you think I should talk to, or do you know of anyone hiring in this area? You kind of have to step your way through it. And I think sometimes there's that desperation that a lot of young people will come in with, like, I really need a job. But people get turned off by that. That's not um, very appealing. So really 
try to make those connections. And by the way, it doesn't have to be with Penn State or it could be anybody. It could be someone else on LinkedIn that might have the same type of job and say, you know, like you, I'm really interested or I saw your profile and I'm impressed by the work that you're doing or I read this article about you. People are easily, I guess, when you flatter them, they're more willing to maybe reply that you show a genuine interest and you've read up on them. So that's kind of how I would uh, get past the HR front door. Question is from Dina. So should they be looking for more internships if they have not had one yet? That's a great question. So, you know, the lack of internships um, can definitely impact things, but I, I think there's opportunities to find experience and it doesn't have to be this formal six, eight, 10 week internship. I think even now while they're at school or if they're doing it remote, I mean, there's a lot more downtime. So if they could, you know, freelance and do some things part time, we have partnered in the past with a company called uh, Parker Dewey. Uh, we haven't, it's not a partnership. We just know that they do the, what's called micro internships. Companies are looking for college students to do maybe one week or two weeks worth of work remotely, whether it's cleaning up a database or working on a presentation. And I think the more that they can find even small opportunities to do some work and supporting a business will give them, you can stack them together, but at least you can kind of piece it together. Even if there's an opportunity to volunteer, um, even things they do on campus or whether it's through THON or a club, it doesn't all have to be in an internship. I think the goal that employers wanna see is, what skills do you have? What skills have you learned? And show me an example of how you've demonstrated that skill. So we all know, THON, there's enormous ways to demonstrate leadership, project management, communication. They just want to see how did you do it? How did you explain it? So I think I know there's a lot of stress around internships. And by all means, if there's an opportunity, um, I think that's good. And I think just to answer the question, too, sometimes I get the question, should a recent grad go right into an internship when they graduate instead of a full time job? And if that internship allows for experience or there's an opportunity to potentially transition um, for the right industry, absolutely, I think everything should be considered, right? Everything's on the table at this point. But don't feel that it has to be this big fancy internship and a big rotational program. They can piece different things together to, to do work. And you know, even offering a small business to, you know, I'll do your digital marketing for you. Let me try to um, manage your accountant, your, your books for you. I, I think there's ways that they can get experiences through smaller, um, smaller roles. Okay, so my son, it's a good question. All right, so my son has to do an initial interview on higher screen. He's great at talking to people, but how do you translate that into an interview when there's no live feedback? Um, and I think you might mean either higher view. There's a number of companies. So we are actually, uh, we're on with the people at higher view yesterday. And I'm very excited because we are actually going to get the software that, that <laughs> students are interfacing with when they need to practice. So I'm really excited about that. It's challenging. It is challenging. And what the, you know, and more is as we're learning about the tool, and learning about what their thinking is, is that, you know, the goal is that the, the higher view or higher screen is really to replace the phone screen. And it's the way to get them, you know, more accelerated. And when they're in these conversations, they are looking for your kids to make sure that they are saying some of the key words that would be needed in the job. Um, and I know it's hard for those who obviously it's a natural, it's, you know, it's natural to have a two way conversation where you have someone nodding your head and giving feedback. And when you don't have that, it, it's challenging. And I think the best advice is one is you have to practice, 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 practice. Do not jump on and just do it. You have to really think through how am I going to express that I have certain skills? How am I going to share, you know, you have to run through certain scenarios of different practicing interview questions about tell me a time you had to deal with conflict or how you solved a problem or how you worked in a team. I mean, these things need to be thought through and practiced in front of video ahead of time. They need to see what they look like. And I think the goal is, you know, they, <sighs> as coming from the, the higher view side or the, they don't, the goal is not to create so much stress, even though we know it, there's a lot of stress there. 
it's to really help shorten the process. So the more that your student can be concise and on point and you know, looking at the camera and practicing their answers, most likely they'll at least get through to, to a, um, hopefully a live interview. But uh, I think just really understanding what the company's looking for and how their skills align and match to it. And, and there needs to be preparation. It could not be a, you know, I'll just wing it and let me just do it now. Uh, there, there needs to be preparation involved. I hope, I hope that answers for you. Okay. Um, my son isn't sure if he wants a job based on his chosen major. He had a great internship planned for last summer. Um, and of course it never happened. The internship could have reeled him in or helped rule him out, whether his major was of interest. Now he's just angry, disconnected, understandable, but time to rev it up for something. But where and what? Oh my gosh, I so get this. Um, you know, one thing that I didn't mention, and I'll say it now, that the toll that this has taken on our kids and especially their mental health is, um, is you know, immeasurable. We, you know, it's what it, this has done in terms of things being canceled or rejected. I mean, they're, I feel that they're fragile and they're struggling. And even though, you know, we give all this advice to say, go do this and go do that, it's mentally very hard when they've been rejected or when they haven't had, you know, an experience and they're just like, why bother? Why bother? You know, I'm not gonna get it. It's really hard. And um, that's not uncommon. And then I, you know, that, that feeling, and I guess, you know, as parents, and I'll speak like as a mom, you know, we need to really be in tune to our kids about, are they just stressed out because the job search is hard or is something more going on and the need to focus on their mental health and get them support or really, you know, make sure, you know, really dive in and make sure that they're getting the help they need because we can tell them, you know, call this person or go to the alumni network, but if they're mentally not in the space, um, they need help. They need help. And unfortunately, you know, it's a crisis right now in our country, how many people, everyone, especially our young people need mental health support. So I don't know you who, you know, we haven't, we don't, we haven't met and talked and I'm not a therapist, but I have talked to hundreds of parents and hundreds of kids. And I can tell when maybe there's something a little that might need more attention. So that would just be my first, um, just first suggestion is make sure you check in with your kids and make sure they're okay or get them the help to be okay. And the job stuff can wait because they need to be healthy. That's, that's the priority. Um, and in terms of, you know, the frustration from last summer, I mean, first of all, I actually feel like you said he was in radio or podcasting. I feel like podcasts are exploding. Um, people are listening more, or taking in more, um, content ever than ever, like, you know, maybe create a podcast, maybe it doesn't have to be, there's things they can do on their own. Maybe this is a time to take a mini course, maybe take a certification, maybe learn something that you have. And these can be short little mini classes in addition to what they're doing at school. Again, they have some, they have spare time. Unfortunately, there's a lot of downtime. So whether they never took, you know, that Excel class learning pivot tables, or maybe they want to learn data analytics. Maybe they want to learn sound engineering. There's opportunities now, I think, to take also many courses that can enhance areas that they're thinking about and that they might want to, you know, want to go into. Um, and I appreciate that someone else chimed in that the College of Communication still has opportunities for this semester um, as short internships if they if he could fill it in. So again, this is why I love this community, this family, because we're so helpful to each other and really trying to, you know, to look to look at opportunities. Um, another question from Kathy. So reaching out to professors for references to apply for positions and internships and not getting a reply. Any suggestions? Uh, so <laughs> one of my favorite phrases, and I, I use this, uh, someone told me this some time ago, is when you're trying to get someone to answer you, whether it's a professor, whether it's an employer, um, and they just haven't, I give them like, I follow up, maybe we'll send a note, an article or something that's relevant. And then I use this phrase probably by the third or fourth email to say, please pardon my persistence. Please pardon my persistence to let them know that you're not going anywhere until you get the answer that you need. And I would say, if you have a professor that you need a reference from, 
and that it's critical to an application, grad school, something for a company that you keep saying, please pardon my persistence. I really need this. Sometimes, you know, in the either academia world, business world, people are busy. They're getting hundreds of emails. They need the multiple prompts. Your kids are not bothering them. They're not being, you know, a pest. They actually need to keep reminding them, like, I'm here. I need to get the information. Now, just to add on one thing, another parent had asked me this um, via email the other day about reference letters from professors. And the question was, should my son get reference letters before graduating from his professors so that he can then email them with his resume to an employer that he's looking for? And my answer to that is, is no. Um, what I would, I don't think it's a good idea to just mail a reference letter with a resume just blind. I just don't think that's great. They didn't ask for it. I, I think you need to be further into the process. What I would suggest your kids do is if there's professors that they have a relationship with, say, would you be willing to be a reference for me? Can I put your name down on a reference list? Can I, excuse me, come back to you and just get their concurrence that they're willing to be a reference. So when the job comes up and they ask for references, maybe what your child wants to do is you want them to go back to the professor saying, I'm looking at this type of job. Can you make sure you mention this and this about me? I mean, people want direction because you don't know what the job's going to be. So you want to guide the professor on how to write the letter or how to write the recommendation or say it. So I think um, the letter itself, I'm not sure how relevant that is. A lot of references right now are typically held where they ask a survey or they do a quick phone call. So I'm not as concerned about the letters, more about just getting their agreement before they graduate as well. And one other thing about professors, I know it's so hard because they're remote and it's hard to forge those relationships, but I think professors know about jobs. They know about internships. They know about opportunities. So for your kids to make sure that they do try to connect with the professor through office hours. I know it's all virtual. I know it's hard, but to share, say, hey, I'm really looking into this field, or I know that you're an expert in this area. Do you have advice? Do you have anyone that you think I should speak with? Take advantage of as many resources that you have at Penn State right now, before graduation, before any of them leave. They want to maximize all of the resources, professors, career services, advisors, anyone that can help them use it as much as you can right now. Sorry, I went off tangent a little bit, but I just want to make sure everyone uses those resources. Okay. Oh, this, this was the next question, which are, um, so the question came out is how do you incorporate career services into your job search? Haven't seen much mention of that in various posts. So let me just be clear. I am a big proponent of using career services. The problem is the statistic, by the way, the national statistic that only four in 10 kids go to career services. And I think here's, there's, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I think a lot of kids, when they come into school, they're like, oh, I'll worry about that later. Or mom and dad have a friend or someone, it'll work itself out. Like they just don't think they have to worry about it so early. I think the other reason why kids don't use career services is that they're intimidated. They're afraid that if they go to career services and someone there says, well, tell me what you'd like to do or tell me what area you wanna go into. And if they don't have an exact answer, maybe they're intimidated by that. Um, but I would say make use, again, make use of the resources. You know, Career services has to do their own cell job. The challenge in a lot of career services, and I won't speak to Penn State or not, is that a lot of times they don't have a lot of resources compared to the number of kids. So sometimes it's very, I, what I have found, it's very tactical, like, well, here's a resume sample, or here's a cover letter sample. Well, that doesn't always dig underneath of like, well, how do I figure out what to do with my life? Um, which was one of the reasons why we, we started this business. But I would say, use career services, go call, <laughs> connect. I think there is actually a session tomorrow that career services is hosting via Zoom, just coincidentally um, offered to every parent and student. But you have to make use of the resources. They're there. And I think um, the more, the better. Um, someone actually just asked about if there's another career fair for SMEAL this semester. Oh, yeah, the problem with like these virtual career fairs. I don't know if there's one for SMEAL, but I'll tell you this in terms of just touching on the virtual career fair piece. Um, virtual career fairs are challenging. 
and I spoke with my son and a lot of his friends about their experience. And, you know, even one of them who's in SMEAL, in supply chain, he's in a Sapphire program, like getting all this attention, told me about how he would have to wait three to four hours to get into a room, you know, a, a virtual room just to speak to an employer and how the long lines, you know, that went from in person to online, or sometimes people would just drop off. And uh, I was actually fortunate enough, I was actually quoted in the Wall Street Journal in December about virtual career fairs. And really our net is you have to do a lot of legwork and preparation ahead of time. You know, you need to know, have a plan of who are the employers I wanna see, what are the specific jobs I wanna go after, and then be ready what you're going to say. Now, the difficulty that's occurred is this level of technology that if they're not ready to handle the volume, and of course at Penn State we know about the volume and the lines, um, that's a huge challenge, which goes back to what I said earlier is get the names of who these recruiters are. By the way, if you call career services, they have the entire list of all the companies attending and probably the first and last names and emails of all of the recruiters. And your child should go back to them saying, I missed that, or I wasn't able to log in. Can you share with me the name of the recruiter, the Penn State recruiter that was recruiting for Pepsi or Target? And they should reach out to them directly via LinkedIn or via the email. And they need to share with them why they, you know, what value they have to offer and why it might be worth talking to them further or why they're interested in the company. But it just goes back to there needs to be this perseverance and grit and especially when the, the virtual career fairs this year were tough it just was tough the technology was not always working right um people were not prepared there wasn't a lot of training uh so you know lauren is actually she's going to put in the chat some uh virtual career fair tips we actually have a tip sheet that we have so if there are any upcoming fairs feel free to grab that and they can um they can use it as a as a resource, but yeah, great question. Uh, and they're not going away, so we need they need to get ready to keep going on virtual career fairs. Okay, um, any insight for the hospitality industry considering the hit it has taken due to COVID? My daughter's a hospitality major and graduating in May. So this is similar to the con you know conversation we had earlier about who is hiring. Right, hospitality has been hit hard, entertainment, sports, the arts, it's going to be challenging. So the jobs for, I, I actually do think hospitality is gonna kind of edge its way back, but you have to be, it's gonna be extremely competitive and extremely limited. And I think, again, you have to think about what, what area in hospitality was she trying to work in, you know, HR, customer service, or in, management, trying to understand what are the skills that she was trying to leverage and use in the hospitality sector? And is there a potential industry right now where she could transfer those skills and maybe get more experience? So maybe if you wanted to be in hospitality, maybe you think about, I know it's not the same thing, but maybe I want to work for a pharmaceutical company because I still wanted to be in, you know, dealing with clients. Maybe I want to go into sales. Maybe I want to do, in there's different areas and angles that I think you sometimes need to think about or broaden your your um, your willingness to look at other organizations. And I think to me, we're we're all about it's not so much the major; it's what's your skill set, what are you really good at that's you know you can prove and has a measurable result. You know, are you a leader? Do you know how to do research? Are you a great writer? Are you really excellent at communication? How can those be translated into the fields that are hiring? Um, and I think, you know, obviously it's worth giving it a go and, and seeing if she can reach out, find some Penn State alum that potentially she could talk to. Maybe she could do an internship for the, um, for the Penn Stater. What's going on here? I feel like my video background got a little uh, hosed up. Hold on a second. Um, so, I, you know, I think, um, hold on a second. I just wanna, sorry, there's my green screen. There we go. For some reason, it just started going flunky on me, so I just want to make sure we're back. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I think uh, there's an opportunity to, to just kind of look in the industry and then also maybe cast a cast a wider net. Okay. Uh, let's see. What we got son is same thing. Another person with a very similar story. I think the someone before child is in the school of communications radio show that he loves. 
not sure he knows how to network, what the next step is, which someone would mentor him. I'm really trying to let him do this on his own. Oh gosh, this is so hard, right? Because our kids, and I say kids, they're, you know, young adults, they're 21. They're on, they're on, they're into adulthood, but yet they need help launching. Um, they don't always want our advice. I will just speak for uh, myself. And, but yet we know that they need to do certain things. So I think um, the most we can do is encourage them, but help point out, like, these are the talents. These are the skills that you have. Here's some ideas. And, you know, going back to maybe he creates his own podcast to get started. Maybe there's a way um, to help somebody else who's doing a podcast. I mean, a lot of small businesses right now and entrepreneurs are, I really feel like are growing and are looking for more ways to leverage their business and are, and podcast is a, a big way of doing that. Uh, but if he really wants radio, figuring out what are those radio stations? What are those means? What are those streaming services to, to focus on? Um, and I think there's, there's opportunities there. All right. Um, and I'm jumping over to the, I just want to make sure that everyone looks in the chat because the, all the, re there's a lot of resources in there, but I also want to think, um, Someone asked, is journalism dead <laughs> and what's the pivot? It's so interesting that you say that. I don't think journalism is dead. I actually think like the need for writing and good writers is so critical in so many, so many ways and so many jobs. Like the ability to write and write well is so important. Maybe in terms of, you know, journalism, I, you know, I think in terms of the media industry, there's people are consuming a lot of content. I think it's finding organizations that need help, someone help writing, whether it's the local paper, whether it's someone writing about, you know, politics, whichever way you go, whether it's talking about um, what's happening with vaccines or the things that are hot. And I think even like, you know, there's technical writers, there's healthcare writers. If you're really looking to do, depends what kind of journalism, I think you have to think about, you know, which way do you want to use it? Is it in television, media? Um, but I think, I think you kind of have to, I think there's plenty of opportunities for people who are good writers. I, I really do. Um, okay. There have been a few programs that ask for recommendation letters with the application. So I think I answered that earlier. So yeah. So if they need a recommendation letter, just be persistent to ask the professor, but anyone always be clear about what you want that person to say, because sometimes people need guidance or they forget, you know, there's so many kids that they're not sure what the like, who was this that I spoke to or what did they want? So I always make sure to tell grads that if you need a recommendation letter, make it easy for the person. Make it easy for the person who needs to write it saying, if you could write a recommendation for me, this is the job. And if you could highlight these three points or even write the letter for them in a way and then let them edit, they'll be so relieved. It's like, it makes it easier for them. So when in doubt, let your grad give them more guidance about how they want the letter written and, uh, and go from there. All right, let me just jump back into the questions again. Okay, another interviewing question. Oh, I love this one. How do you best answer the question, what is your biggest weakness? So in our coaching that we do with our clients, so we coach them in small groups and privately, this is a question that we always cover. We just had, uh, did this yesterday, I think. And uh, we actually even do with them, we do a mock interview at the end where everyone has to dress up and we just kind of shoot questions at them the whole time. So our suggestion for the what is your greatest weakness is to, I think you have to remember a couple things. This is not a doctor. This is not a therapist. This is not somebody that you know well. So I do not want any recent grad sharing their most deepest intimate weakness. Don't, you know, don't say, well, my biggest weakness is that I'm really lazy and it's hard to get out of bed. I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's true, but don't share that. You don't want to share something that exposes too much. Or the, the whole goal of this question is that an employer is trying to get you to say something negative about yourself and then see what you say. What we like to say is, you know, pick something that you struggle with, but talk about how you have, you're aware of it and how you're overcoming it. So for example, uh, a greatest weakness could be, um, I really focus in on the details, but sometimes I really like to hold on to a project and keep working on it. But what I've realized over time, working with a team or in a group project, that sometimes I have to let it go because I have to look at the greater good for the rest of the group. And I've learned over time that it has to be good enough. And I feel that's what my greatest weakness is. 
So it's the type of question that you're not lingering on it. You want to kind of answer the question and then get off of it. You don't want to go on and on about how terrible you are at something. You want to just identify one small weakness and what you've done to and give an example of how you're aware of it and how you're overcoming it. So I hope that helps answer that question. We could do a whole thing just on interview questions. Um, my son is a CAS major. I'm not sure I know what CAS stands for, but he is doing his second internship with digital media company that represents influencers. Curious what type of other companies would be interested in this skill set. I mean, first of all, digital media is so big right now um, in so many companies because that is how companies are advertising, whether it's through Google ads or they're using Google analytics, um, they're using Facebook ads, Instagram, TikTok. I, I mean, I think there's so many organizations, by the way, ones that are probably more established that are trying to understand how to speak to the communities that are on these different platforms, um, even in LinkedIn. So I think, you know, looking for companies that are any type of opportunity in the digital marketing space um, and think about what kind of companies he likes, you know, what is it he likes to be a part of, what kind of companies are of interest to him. But I think absolutely, and that he has an internship now, he can completely leverage that in into another role. So I think that's great. And you always want to think about what have I learned in this role that I can now bring to another organization? Because in the end, you know, a lot of times our kids will come to interviews and they'll say, I think this job would be great for me because I would learn this. And what we encourage them is say, don't do that. Don't say how it's great for you. When you talk to an employer, you want to go to the employer and tell them, based on what your focus is and your priorities, I believe my skills can help you to accomplish that because I want to help you grow. I want to help you accomplish your goals. That's what makes a candidate stand out over other candidates. So that's kind of like a really kind of, I'll say secret tip there is if your kids really want to differentiate themselves in an interview, in their conversations, they need to focus on the employer and how they can help that person or that employer be more successful because, you're, because you're, you know, your child is on their team. And, and getting themselves in the other person's shoes, that will make them more appealing to an employer. All right, I hope that answered that question. Um, question, so my son feels like he's bombing at virtual interviews and now he's discouraged. How do I bump up his confidence? So it's hard, it's so hard. The most important thing is sometimes see if he'll let you help him. So what I would take from the, the virtual interview that's really tough is have him, first of all, they should be taking notes during every interview. Jot down the question or try to recall the questions that are being asked and go through it with you, a friend, a family member, someone they have to practice. And I know sometimes they're very private or they don't want to share, but in order for us to help, we have to be able to see it or whether they get a mentor or whether someone like us can help them, but they need to have someone run through it with them so they can get feedback. Another simple way is just hit the record button on the video on your phone or on your own Zoom and see what you look like when you're answering a question. Practice answering the question, looking into the camera and see what your voice sounds like. Are you, you know, stuttering over your words? Or do you have a clear story? And, or take the video and let men show it to someone else. Say, what do you think? How do you think I did in answering that question? We use that a lot because no matter how great you are, think of answering it. And by the way, no matter how great the answer is on a piece of paper, it's completely different when it comes to saying it and verbalizing it. So it doesn't matter if your resume is stellar. If you can't communicate and articulate the value that you have, it's going to be hard. So practice, practice, practice is my, is my net advice on that. Okay. Um, let me make sure I'm getting all these. We want our son to have the job that he wants and the location he wants. He hasn't had an internship due to COVID. We don't have any personal friends in the industry. At what point do we suggest he apply for any job in his field, even if it's not where he wants to be so that he can gain some experience? Great question. We get this a lot. You know, this, there's a point of a little bit of desperation of like, I'll just take a job. I'll take any job or, or you're telling them just go do anything. I, I I would resist saying that. I think 
there's a there's a you have to balance being open to multiple opportunities versus like I'll do anything for anyone. When we want our kids to reach out to someone, to connect, to make a connection. Very often people want to say, well, tell me, how can I help you? Or what are you looking for? So there's a concept that we teach, and I'll just tell you briefly. We call it, you know, understanding your core skills. Core skills are three skills. It's those that are you are the most competent, most skilled at, and you enjoy doing. And it's based on actual experience that you've had. So if you were a chair for the th one of the THON committees, so let's say one of your skills is leadership because you had to lead a number of people to you know, accomplish this incredible task this, for this charity. Or maybe one of your skills is research, that you've done research in a lab for a professor, for a project, and you can talk about how you looked in up information, you interviewed people, you, you know, looked at different sources. But having clarity on the skills will then help you say, well, if those are my core skills, what are the types of companies that need those skills? Or what are the kinds of jobs? Same thing, go back to that alumni tool. Start looking at other Penn State alumni who had the same major or maybe have the same interest or same skill set, and start talking to them about how did you make the shift from this major into the job you are now? What made you, you know, move in that direction? What, maybe it's something that they never heard of. A lot of them, they don't understand that there's thousands of jobs that they don't even know about and they have to, have to learn. So I know it's not a, I don't think I gave a simple answer, but I think the clarity on what they want and then looking for opportunities. If they say, I'll do anything for anyone, it just, it's, it's so broad. It's hard to, how do you know what to apply to? How do you know what people to look at? I, I think you need to have some focus is, is kind of my, my net feeling. All right. Um, any advice for getting jobs in the government sector. I've had some clients in the government sector. You know, one of the biggest issues with the government sector is you have to have all the security clearances done. So depending on where you are, I mean, security clearance could take like six months, a year. Um, so it just depends on what you're looking for. So I know it's kind of an, a broad question, the same thing I'd have to say, you know, what part of the government are you looking to work for? What type of role? Uh, understanding that, but the other challenge is that the background check and the clearance process in a lot of government positions really extends it out. So maybe you want to be applying to some non-government jobs while you're applying to the government roles because that can just take some time. Um, but I'd need to understand a, a touch more just to hope that helps. Um, I think I answered most of the questions here. So I'll cover, um, you know, one or two other things, but I think we covered a lot. And if there's anything else in the last few minutes, I will, I will, um, I will touch on it. So, you know, the net is, um, there are opportunities and a Penn State degree is incredibly high regarded. Okay. That's why we all sent our kids there. Um, and they know it, we know it, but it's not an automatic. You can't just say, oh, I went to Penn State and you know, you're know you hired as much as everyone would love that. There is work to be involved and there is time right now to be networking with everyone on camp, you know, with people or peers, with the alumni network. They And, and I very often parents will say to me, well, I don't have a network in the area that my kids wanna go into, so I don't feel like I can help them. That's okay, that's absolutely okay. If you do, by all means, you know, make connections. But it's okay that kids build their own network in the area that they want to go into and they need to talk to people. People hire people, they need to have these conversations and that is what leads to them being pushed further into a job opportunity. There's hundreds, thousands of jobs that never get posted, never get posted. And that's how they tap into what's called like the secret or the hidden job market. When you start networking, that's how you, our kids are going to find the opportunities that were never even on the job board. And you know what happens? When you start t talking to someone who knows about a job that's not even posted, no one wants to go through the process of hiring an interview. They get fast-tracked to the person who's hiring because it makes it easier. If they come across as the right candidate, that is how you get into a job and you can bypass this whole online application process. Um, 
And the other thing is they have to persevere. I know it's hard. This takes like persistence and sometimes it doesn't feel very good and the rejection is hard. It's not personal. It's not personal. I know so many of our kids take it that way, but it's not personal. It's business. And we need to get them in the mindset that it's okay. You got to just keep going. Um, you know, you just got to do it again. You got to do it again. And you got to block the time. You got to allocate the time. And if they have a heavy schedule this semester and they got to finish out, then so be it. Let them finish school. They not need to do that. That's their priority. And they'll focus when they graduate. But if they have some time now and they have some capacity, getting the process started, talking to contacts, reaching out, um, making those connections will be the, the best you know, possible thing. Um, and if there's any way you know, that we can provide any additional support, uh, you could just reach us at our website, nextgreatstep.com, in the contact us. We do a, also a complimentary consultation for any parent or child for 20 minutes to see if there's, there's an opportunity to support. But I'm not here to, to sell you. I really wanted to just offer value and see if we can help answer some questions um, and if need be, we can do this again uh, in another month or two if we feel that there's enough um, enough interest in in getting getting more information. Um, let's see. I have one or two more questions before our time is up, so I'll I'll, I'll take it right till one o'clock. So here's another question: How do you deal with job experience that is not related to your major on your resume, like a camp counselor? Sometimes that is most of what you have. Perfect question. I, that is super common where kids are camp counselors, they deliver pizza, they scoop ice cream. And I think in every experience, there's something that they learned that came out of it. Maybe when they were a camp counselor, they had to manage, you know, 15 children. Maybe that shows leadership or their ability to communicate. Maybe they did talk back to parents, share with parents an, an update. Um, maybe when they, you know, worked at the ice cream store, they had to open. They had to have customer service skills. They had to manage customer complaints when the ice cream fell on the ground. I, I think there's ways to show how they are able to build a skill set even though they might feel like, well, I was a camp counselor, that's not the same as having an internship at a Fortune 500 company. That's okay. That's who they are. They're young. This is what they do. I think it's just be able to explain how you've had those experiences and how that could help an organization. And if there's a way through your classwork or certifications or things that they've done on their own, volunteering, that can also show their skill set, I think that's valuable as well. But by all means, I mean, my son is a, was a camp counselor for many years. And we put that on the resume because that's that's where it is. You know, that's that's what they've done. So you just have to maximize that. Um, let's see, we got another question. Okay, so how can the student access LionLink? Is this different than the LinkedIn tool? So I don't know too much about LionLink. I'm guessing that's behind the Penn State website firewall. Um, I'm pretty sure that, but that is different than LinkedIn. So LinkedIn. Let's just, it's a social, it's a business social networking site. So let's just start off, if, if your kids are not on it, if you're not on it, I encourage everyone to get on it, it's free, but it really is the de facto business networking site. And how it works is that the more connections that you have, the better the information is that you see. So you can follow companies, you can follow people. By the way, anyone on this call, please connect with me. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I post uh, every week, I write blogs. You can kind of get a sense of what we talk about. I give advice there. But your kids should be connecting on LinkedIn with every single person that they know at Penn State who they find on LinkedIn and or any adult, any professors, any uh, anyone they need to, to, to build that network. So yeah, I think those are two different things. So LinkedIn is a public social media business platform. The lion link is more of the behind the firewall. I think it's through, you know, behind Penn State. And there is a tool probably through career services um, and the Penn State tools that you can access. I just don't know specifically which one, but by all means contact career services and find out what it is. So that way they have access to that. All righty. Okay, um, I'll give you one more. Okay, so I'll give you one more. So just to, before some people leave, I'm recording and I will send everyone who registered, I will send you a link to the recording. I will probably put it up to like a private YouTube so everyone will, will have access to that. Uh, last question. So can a candidate look for a job in their minor versus their major? 
The major was energy engineer and the minor was environmental engineer. What are the chances of landing a job in your major? I would say absolutely look for a job in your minor. Again, it just shows if you have a certain knowledge base and this is your area and that you read up on it and you're interested, I think there's nothing preventing you from pursuing a job in your minor um, compared to your major. By the way, I have lots of grads who look for jobs that have nothing to do with what they're majored in. We may not be so thrilled as parents to hear that after all the investment we're making, but sometimes it just doesn't always work out um, that way. But by all means, absolutely pursue the minor if that's something that's exciting to them or there's opportunities. Um, they should go for it. They should go for it. All right. So we're at the hour. I am so thrilled with the um, amount of people who joined and the interaction and the in, uh, the questions. And um, I hope this was helpful. Um, my goal is really just to you know offer support and advice. And again, I'm on every social media I'm on. I have Next Great Step is on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Um, you can follow me directly or connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, I've played around with TikTok here and there, not too much, trying to figure it out. But, um, but my goal is, you know, to really provide to be a, a source for, for fellow parents because uh, we're all in it together and uh, cross fingers that maybe we could see each other at some kind of graduation in the future. So again, thank you so much for, uh, for joining. Any questions you want to learn more about what we do at Next Great Step, please go to our website, nextgreatstep.com. Click on the contact us. Uh, page and we'd be happy to connect with you. Thanks so much and uh, have a great day.